Hello, everyone. Welcome to the VCIS 2020 workshop for the network data analysis and visualization. My name is Byung Yu Gong, a PhD candidate at Arizona State University in the program of Education Policy and Evaluation. For the next couple of hours, we will explore the network data analysis and visualization from theory to practice. This video was initially recorded exclusively for the workshop registrants of the CIS 2020. But with a generous permission of the Comparative and International Education Society, we decided to open this lecture to the general public. I hope this time will be fruitful for everyone who are interested in improving their knowledge and skills of network data analysis. This course targets basic level audiences who have not much heard of the network theory analysis before. Accordingly, this lecture aims to make participants first understand the basics of network theories with their fundamentals and mathematical concept. Second, understand how the data can be archived, structured, and analyzed for the network analysis using RStudio and Gaffey. Third, understand how the network data can be visualized using RStudio and Gaffey. This course does not cover mathematics of the network theories, does not using highly abstract mathematical formula of the network theories. But I will try to let you get a sense of mathematical concept of the network analysis in this lecture. Also, I will guide you to create a network object using the data analysis softwares so that you can have a chance to walk through the authentic analytical and visualization process with the real world data. This lecture consists of two sessions. In the first session, we'll concentrate on concepts and theories. In this part, I will briefly introduce the basic definition, history, and examples of network analysis, and then move on to the fundamentals and mathematical concepts of network theories. Through this part of the lecture, we'll learn what is a network, how it was conceived, and what are the main features of the network. In the second session, we'll get our hand dirty by running the real analysis using iGraph and Gaffey software. We will get a chance to run the network analysis with a real-world example, and how the theories and concepts you learn are calculated and visualized through the software. The entire session will take approximately two hours. And let me start with the concepts and theories. I will start by introducing definition, history, and examples of the network analysis. Then what is the network? It seems very complicated and difficult to define a network at first. Once you see the large size of complex global network, as you can see, the example here. Even this example is a very small part of the global network. But let's try to zoom up only this part here on the left side. It is embarrassingly simple. And if you felt in that way, you're right. The basic element of the network is a pair of dots with a single connecting line. Not more than that. Whatever complex the network is, they can be all broken down into this small element consisting of one pair of dots with a single connecting line. So you don't need to feel overwhelmed by the complex, large-sized network. And that is the reason why Newman defined network as a collection of points joined together by lines. Usually, the dot is called node or vertex, and the line is called line or edge. I recommend you to be get used to both terms 
as they are widely used and not strictly differentiated. There are many different kinds of network exist in the world. And I will briefly mention about representative network examples here. Most symbolic example is our internet. Internet is a collection of small connection between computers and routers through cables and wireless router connections. Power grid also has a very similar structure. In social network, we can assume that there is a friendship network wherein each person is connected to each other through feelings of affinity. In academia, we are supposed to refer to each other, and thanks to this practice, there is a large web of citation network. Biology is also one of the largest fields leading the research in network analysis as our body, brain, and ecosystem is composed of complex network of various elements. There is a line of intellectual history in the development of path of the network analysis. It was largely recognized that the network theory started from the graph theory, and the famous example is Quanisbrook bridge problem. Euler proved that there is no single path that can cross each bridge only one time to cross all seven bridges using graph abstraction method. Then later on from 1960s to 1990s, social science was one of the most influential fields developing network analysis theories. Moreno Sociogram was the pioneering research of the social network analysis. This research created friendship network based on a simple question to ask to each student, who wants to be sitting next to whom? The research clearly mapped out how the gender divide grows as students grow up from first to sixth grade. Even though the network analysis has been nurtured and popularized by the social science for a long while, the recent development shows it is moving toward more general theory of network science as the available data increases and big data analytics looms over. For instance, thanks to the development of the internet, the researchers do not need to do social survey to ask their level of affinity between friends but rather collect direct interaction data through social network in online or personal device measuring physical distance between students. In that way, the researchers started, started creating hard data. This new movement synthesizes concept and mathematics-based graph theory with empirical case-based social network analysis. The example picture here is from the Grand Gene's Twitter network. Grand Gene is one of the founding father of network software Gaffy. As you can see from this picture, it clearly shows the massive size of social network and its details with visualization techniques, differentiating each vertex and edges with size, color, and distance. The network studies usually but not exclusively aim to understand the pattern of connection and interaction. With the structural features of the network, the network researchers aim to explain behavior and phenomenon. With such abstraction of the real-world phenomenon comes at a cost of losing a lot of information. Just imagine that complex interpersonal relationship is reduced into a single line counted as one. Researchers would refer to each other with multiple reasons. Some may refer to others to criticize, recognize, or appeal to authority. But in the network analysis, such complexity is largely ignored. And they are simply represented as vertices and edges. However, Still, such a high, high level of abstraction is useful to understand the real-world phenomenon. 
because it allows large scale and efficient calculation of the network structure. I'd like to talk more detail about the networks of various occasions, because each network shares common features with minor differences. Once you can understand the universal features of the network, you can predict the nature of each different network. The first example is our internet, which hardwires computers to the optic fever. This picture indicates the internet network at the global scale. At the core of the network, there are high-performing routers sending signals long distance. They are mostly possessed by the large telecommunication companies. At the semi-core, there are intermediary providers and resellers. And the periphery is filled with end users. In this way, the broad mapping of the network instantly provides a glimpse of the power dynamics of the network through density, color, and size. The social network represents connection, interaction, and relationship between people. The vertex means person, group, family, class, organization, or even nation. In the social network, like other physical networks such as power grid or neural net, edge mostly indicates invisible and abstract connection between people, such as contact, affinity, or co-membership. The social network has usually been a small-sized network centering around each key person in small group or organization, which is called the ego network. But thanks to the recent, devel recent development of big data and data mining, the size of social network has been, has been dramatically enlarged, and it enabled researchers to have more bird's-eye view of social network phenomena. The given picture here shows a Twitter network. In this picture, the core entails person with more power, reputation, or better access to the social capital. Information network has been one of the oldest subfields of network science, independently developed theory and concept for a long while, taking a large portion of network studies in social science these days. It usually composes a network out of citation network of each document. Citation practice is a common role in academic, legal, and patent writing, revealing how the documents are created and influenced by the other existing papers. In the citation network, the vertex can be document, journal, subject area, author, institution, and nation. The edges can be citation or membership of the articles and authors. Also, citation network studies emphasizes co-citation or bibliographic coupling, which represents the share of the same reference in a citation list. So in this co-citation or bibliographic coupling, edges between vertices mean they share the common reference in their reference list. In these days, with a big data and text mining technique, co-occurrence of certain keywords is also a very popular measure exploring network structure of the documents. This picture here is from my own research exploring citation network of the education and AI papers. The core of the network includes the most cited papers or authors, and this means they have higher academic reputation and performance. The citation network analysis is widely used to identify key scientific research investment, as the network reveals what kind of research topic is the most popular in a certain field. The citation network analysis technique is used to identify vaccine development of the COVID-19, to identify the state of the art of the vaccine research, helping to set the next research agenda.
The last network example is the biological network. Biological network is also one of the key areas of network science. In particular, neural network is in our brain has been a source of inspiration for other physical and electrical network system we created for a computer and chips. The special feature of the neural network is that it is three-dimensional network, not a two-dimensional like most of the other networks. Also, neural network is a dynamic network system, changing its shape and pattern according to the input and output frequency and intensity. Thus, it is one of the most challenging network objects for many of the network scientists, and more new discoveries are expected. So now you learned what is the network and how many different kinds of network structure is commonly explained and represented by universal elements of vertices and edges. Then let's jump into the fundamentals and mathematical concepts of network theories. Understanding the structure of the network data is the very key to calculate network features using software tools as the network analysis software is only allow a certain format of data structure. The most basic data structure for the network analysis is a node list. Node list is a vector of vertices in the network. Let's assume that there is a network with six vertices. Then as you can see in this example, the node list will be a single column or vector of the nodes. It is pretty much simple. The major role of node list is giving attributes to each vertices almost limitlessly. For instance, each node in this node list can have gender, age, and grade as its node attributes. Such information in the node attributes take a critical role in visualizing the network giving different color and size to each vertices depending on the node attributes. But as we all know, network is not complete only with the dots. We need to represent the connecting lines between the dots. Edge list is a vector composed of a pair of vertices having connection to each other. In this example, vertex 1 has connecting line with vertex 2 and vertex 4. These connections are presented as pair of numbers like 1 and 2 and 1 and 4 in the edge list. The edge list is a very key for network analysis as node list is redundant when we have an edge list. It is because the edge list gives information of node list, but node list does not give information about edges. Edge list also has edge attribute information. It is mostly about edge weights given by frequency or intensity of the interaction between vertices. In this example, I just assigned edge weight with a standardized score from zero to one. The last but the most important data structure you should learn is the adjacency matrix. Once you can understand the adjacency matrix, it is much easier to comprehend many complex mathematic representations of the network analysis. It is still pretty much simple. The adjacency matrix presents one when there is an edge between the two vertices or zero when there is no connection. So in this example in the adjacency matrix, you can see the one in here because the versus number two and number one has a connection line with one. As you can see, there is one line. If there is edge weight, each number in the matrix elements represent edge weights instead of one and zero. As you can see, this adjacency matrix includes nodes and edge list information in one place.
to build up your data for the network visualization. You need to structure your data set to represent edge list or adjacency metrics. As I told you, only with the node list, we cannot visualize the network data. However, to create a network showing node attribute, you need to build up your data set to include node list in addition to edge list and adjacency metrics. That is because only with adjacency metrics and edge list as a raw data, you cannot assign any node or edge attribute. Later on at the session two, I will show you how the raw data structured as node list and edge list can be ready for analysis and visualization through iGraph and Gephi software. The one thing I want you to keep in mind is that whatever data you have, once you can convert them into edge list or adjacency metrics, you can create your own network data and graph. There are many different types of network according to their key features. So from this slide, I will introduce some of the essential key features of the network. First, the network is divided into two groups of undirected or directed network according to each edge types. In the undirected network, the pair of vertices in its edge list is not ordered. In this example, the pair of vertices i and j is not ordered. That means i and j is equal to j and i, which is because the order doesn't matter. But in the directed network here, the pair of vertices is ordered. Thus, i and j is not the same as j and i. They are different. Then let's see how the undirected or directed network is represented through the edge list and adjacency metrics. First, I recommend you to practice writing edge list and adjacency metrics here for yourself with given network graph here on the left side. The first graph is undirected network, and the second one is directed network. Just pause this video for a few minutes and try to write down the answers as you learned how to do it previously. And I will show you the answers. Okay, now let's check out the answers. First, let's look at the edge list. The answer should be like this. Did you recognize the difference between the directed directed and undirected network. In the edge list of the undirected network, the pair of vertices does not indicate any directionality. For instance, one and two does not entail that information flows from one to two. It just indicates that there is a connection between the two. But in the edge list of the directed network, the pair of vertices entail direction. This one and two in the edge list means that information flows from one to two. Then let's check out the answers for the adjacency metrics. For the undirected network, the adjacency matrix is symmetric. Once you compare upper and lower side of the diagonal line, you would recognize that they are the same. But in the directed network, the adjacency matrix is asymmetric. That is because a pair of vertices represents directionality. The second key features of the network is edge weight. The network has been introduced so far in this lecture was all unweighted one. In the unweighted network, edge only represents information of whether there is a link or not. But in the weighted network, 
edge represents strength or intensity of the connection. The thickness of the edge shows the strength of the tie. And let's see how the unweighted or weighted network is represented through the edge list and adjacency metrics. As we did before, just pause this video for a few minutes and try to write down the answers for the weighted network below. And I will show you the answers. Now, let's check out the answers. I prepared for the answer of the unweighted network to compare it with the weighted one. The edge list of the weighted network has an extra column for the edge attributes. This is the edge weight and shows how strongly each vertices are connected to each other. In the adjacency matrix, the previous mark of 1 in the unweighted network is replaced with the edge weight, like 2 or 4 or 3. Those kind of numbers are not be seen in the adjacency matrix of the weighted network, but it's here for the unweighted uh, for the weighted network adjacency matrix. Bipartite network means the network having two different types of vertices. For instance, in the example in this slide, vertices denoted as I on the left side in the case of person, while J on the right side means events or membership. In this in the bipartite network, vertices in the same category does not share direct edges between them. Unlike the non bipartite network, this is a very special kind of network, but widely used more than with the. Then let's write edge list and adjacency matrix of the bipartite network. Please, pa please pause this video for a while and try to find the answer. Okay, then let's check out the answers. Making up the edge list should not be difficult as it is not much different from the previous interacted networks. But there is a huge difference in the representation of the adjacency matrix. You would see the rectangular shape of adjacency matrix having only events vertices I1, I2 at its row names, while only person vertices J1, J2, J3 at its column names. This is called instant matrix. As we learned, bipartite network does not allow to create edges between the same kind of vertices. But there is a way to transform this network to represent co-membership or proximity network, marking a direct edges between the same kind of vertices. In this example bipartite network, each vertice on the left node notice as J is people, and on the right side notice as I means event. You can create an event network based on the shared participants like this. This may give us an information on the characteristics of each event based on its composition of participants. Also, we can create a social network of the people based on their event participation. In this social network, people are connected based on their shared event experiences, which gives a glimpse of their personal interest. In this reason, a part of the network is very important for the network analysis. Centrality means the strength or power of the nodes inside of the network. The centrality has been considered to be the most important index we can create out of the network data. Thus, from this slide, we will explore various measures of centrality. The first centrality measure is a degree. 
Degree is the number of edges linked to each vertex. In this example network, vertex 1 has two degrees as it has two edges. For a directed network, there is only one type of degree. But for a directed network, there are two types of degrees, in-degree and out-degree. As you can see from here, in-degree means the edges heading to the given vertex. Our out degree means the edges coming out of the given vertex. A degree centrality is the simplest measure of centrality, summing up all the degrees each vertex has. In this example network, node attribute is the degree centrality. And it simply sums up all edges each vertex has. And according to the degree centrality, the size of the vertices is decided. The bigger vertices has a bigger score of degree centrality. So in this example network, the vertex number four here has the biggest vertex as this vertex has five connections with the other vertices, which means that this vertex has five degrees. So only with the visual cue in this network graph, we can instantly recognize which vertex has the high centrality that's most powerful and influential in this network. One of the variations of the degree centrality is an eigenvector centrality. The basic concept is this. Vertices having neighbors with more degree centrality have more power than vertices having neighbors with less degree centrality. This concept totally makes sense once you consider the fact that having too many friends who don't have much power to give critical information does not help you out. Rather, you'd better know small number of neighbors having large information resource with better social capital. According to this definition, eigenvector centrality sums the scores of its neighbor's degree centrality. Let me give you an example here. The vertex 1 here has two neighbors of vertex 2 and vertex 4. Thus now the vertex 1 has two degree centrality. Vertex 2 and 4 has three and five of degree centrality for each. For vertex two, it has a three connection. For vertex four, it has a five connection. The Steigen vector centrality of, of vertex one is eight. The sum of three coming from vertex two and five coming from vertex four. According to this calculation, you will find that vertex 3 and 5, here 3 and 5, having same level of degree centrality for each, they have 2 degree centrality, shows different level of eigenvector centrality of 8 for vertex 3 and 7 for vertex 5, even though have the same level of degree centrality. This means that vertex 3 has more connection with the powerful vertices than vertex 5. Then the next centrality measure to introduce is betweenness centrality. The betweenness centrality of, the, of a vertex is counted by the number of shortest path between any pair of vertices passing through the vertex. Let's just assume that, as in the example picture here, Two clusters of network is connected only through the yellow vertex here. If that is the case, although the degree centrality of the yellow one is only two because you have a two connections, its between the centrality must be incredibly huge. Then why the between the centrality has such an importance? Just imagine that we delete this yellow vertex here then we will lose large number of connection between because 
That was the only way the two clusters are connected to each other. So vertices with high between the centrality are gatekeepers, controlling the flow of information and influence passing between others. There are some key measures representing network structure we should know more than centrality measures. From this slide, I will show you some of the measures informing the overall network structure. The first one to introduce here is the network density. The network density is simply calculated by the number of edges divided by the total number of possible edges. The possible edges mean the maximum number of edges physically and mathematically allowed to the given number of vertices. For a simple example, I will elaborate it further. Look at the network here in this slide. In the first graph of G1, there are five vertices and five edges, but it does not represent the maximum number of edges allowed to, the net to this network. As we can see from the below network named G2, the maximum number of edges we can draw is 10. The number then the network density of G1 would be a 5 divided by 10, which means 0 0.5. This is the screen capture from our Studio iGraph package where I calculated the network density. As we can see from here, it also calculated the network density of G1 as 0 0.5. On the other hand, the second graph of G2 here has 1 as a network density score, as it has a maximum number of edges allowed to the network having 5 vertices. Assertivity is also one of the measures showing the network structure. Assertivity is defined as a tendency of vertices to connect others that are like them in some way. We can see many of the real-world examples of the assertative mixing, such as friendship network, clustering together with the same gender, age, and income, and faculty co-authorships, grouping together with the same field and nationality. It is calculated by subtracting a fraction of edges connecting between vertices of the same type in a random graph from a fraction of edges connecting between vertices of the same type in the graph. The random graph means the artificial graph having edge connections by chance with the given number of vertices. Observativity score ranges from minus one to one. And once we get the minus score, it means that vertices tend to connect to the vertices of different kind. But once we get the score of one, it means that vertices only having the same trait flock together. In the example here in the slide, the network is completely divided into two groups having different trait. And there is no single connection between the two different groups. Such a network has a maximum assertivity score of 1, as we can see here from the calculation in our studio. Community detection is also one of the key analytic techniques the network data provides. By detecting communities, we can discover new patterns and substructure of the network. Newman defines community detection as it is a problem of finding the natural divisions of a network into groups of vertices, such that there are many edges within groups and few edges between groups. And how can we detect such community structure? We can use the modularity score and iterate, iterate scoring until we reach an optimal level. The optimal level means the moment when we can get higher modularity score than a random graph. And as I explained before, the random graph is the graph having edges between vertices by chance. Let me elaborate this iterative process further here. The Rubin method 
is one of the variations of the modularity optimization technique widely used in iGraph and Gephi software. As we can see from the slide, we have a network here. And then each of the iterative calculation, as we can see from this graph, will produce modularity scores and continue this iteration until we reach a plateau and stop there. As we can see from this picture, every iteration, it tries adding other vertices into the cluster and calculate the modularity score. The score increased pretty much at the initial phase from graph 1 to 3. That it reaches to the flat moment from 4 to 5. And as a final product, you'd see this clustered network graph. At each of the iteration, you'd find that the color of red and blue increases in its number. And then at the moment it reaches the plateau of the increasing modularity score, it stops there. And we can just find that there are two clusters inside of this network. If you'd like to see how it really works and understand it better, please visit the YouTube video I created a link here. So this is the end of the first session for the theory and concept of the network analysis. I recommend you to repeat this video one or two more times before we jump into the practice session. As I noticed, noticed before, this lecture is for the beginners of the network analysis. Therefore, I skipped many more of network analysis measures for this lecture. I hope I will get more chance to develop this lecture for the intermediate and advanced level audiences in the near future.